I've always been somewhat of a renegade. Creatively, I dare to go where others fear to go. Isaac would hear things that were beyond his knowledge. I support literacy as well as music education in schools and try to save a kid, try to inspire a kid the right way. Contribute, put something back. Do we want to see Isaac Hayes? Isaac Hayes, it is a thrill to have you in our studios today. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I know yeah. that we are one of many stops for you today, but I want you to look at the laundry list of titles that you have. Actor, singer, composer, restaurant owner, radio host, coronated king, black icon. I want you to tell me what, which title do you think best reflects the real Isaac Hayes? Entertainer. That, that uh, puts out the excuses for all my screw-ups. <laughs> <laughs> Is there some, there's some leeway in that wording, in that label? No, just, uh, I've been an entertainer for so long, you know, and I, I've grown through a lot of uh, errors, and, uh, you know, so I, I, they always blame it on the entertainer, so I, I just use that as, a, as an excuse for all the things I've <laughs> messed up. <laughs> Entertainer may be the word that you would like to use to describe you, but really it was your score for the movie Shaft back in 1971 that made you an international star. And it's amazing when you look at the history from where you came from to that point in your life and beyond. Look at the history, though. Go back. You were born in 1942 in Covington, Tennessee, mm -hmm. small, teeny tiny town in rural Tennessee, yeah. north of Memphis, to a poor sharecropper's family. And yeah. your mother passed away when you were one and a half, and your father took off. So you were raised raised by your mother's parents. Mm -hmm. What were they like? They were very sweet people. Uh, they were very dependable. And they were very religious people, too. And uh, all the things I learned, I learned from my grandmother and my grandfather. But things were tough. I mean, you went through a phase, too, where you were actually homeless. Yeah, I was. You know, when we moved to the city, everybody said, go to the city, things are better. But things were great in the country because we grew our own foods and everything, never knew hunger day. But my grandfather's health began to fail when we moved to the city, and I had to live with a, with, with a, with a guy that was kind of a, he was an alcoholic. He got arrested one evening, and then I, I couldn't get in the house, so I had to sleep in cars for about, about 10 days. Yeah. That's scary when you're 10 or 11 years old. It was, but thank God it was the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> and did you like country life? Did you like the, the picking of cotton it. and... Yeah, I, I could. Yeah, I was a daydreamer, and I would stand in the cotton fields and look at planes going overhead. One of these days, I'm gonna be on that plane. I uh, just daydreamed what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. And what, what, what did you want to be? I just wanted to be somebody. I didn't know at that time what I wanted to be. When your grandfather died, when you were 11 years old, you really did fall in those hard times, as you've been, dis oh, it was been discussing. Rough. And took any job you could, in addition to picking cotton, you would shine shoes, you would run errands, deliver groceries, whatever it took to bring in whatever change That's you could. That's right. I even cut grass, I poured cement, mm -hmm. wrecked houses, cleaned bricks. For two cents uh, a piece. Oh, <laughs> oh you, you, you well learned on me, aren't you? <laughs> I did. I checked you out before you sat down in that chair. All right. When you were five years old, you made your singing debut at church. Was that your idea? Yeah. Uh, my grandmother, it was the Easter program. And I think, I think I might have been three, something like that. Anyway, my sister and I did a duet. And uh, we started singing. I, I arranged it. You know, we sang harmony. And my sister messed up. I you could sing right. harmony when you were that little? Oh, yeah. I had big ears. <laughs> They're little. Good ears. Me, but, <laughs> but anyway, she, she messed up. I stopped. Stop. It's not go, don't go like this. It goes like this. And I hummed the part, and I looked at my, now let's, my girl would look at me, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this was in the middle of the Easter program? Yeah. When I was a kid, what did I know? You know, so. Um, you wanted to get it right. That's right. That's right. I always did that. Did your grandmother continuously encourage you? Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, but, you know, some of the people, some of the neighbors, when I started singing uh, secular songs, mm -hmm. popular songs, you ain't going to heaven singing those songs. That's the devil's work, my brother. So I, I went to my music teacher, Mrs. Jones. 
So Miss Jones, am I going to hell? <laughs> she, she said, she said so, young man, yeah. as long as you do well with your talent and don't do anything to harm anybody, I don't think God would be mad at you. So that, let me, that made me feel better. Somewhere along the line, you decided to drop out of school. Why? I love school. But when you reach puberty, that's when you start watching girls. And I realized I had holes in my shoes and patches and all this kind of stuff, so I dropped out of school out of humiliation. And um, one day, a delegation of teachers came to my house. So, Miss Wade, I just hadn't been in school in, in six weeks. Oh, the look that old lady gave me. Busted. I just said, <laughs> wait till they leave. I'm gonna get it now. They said, this young man has so much to offer, we can't lose him. So I went back and I wore a lot of hand-me-downs. Mrs. Georgia, they collected them for you, didn't they? Yeah. The teachers. Mrs. Georgia Harvey, mm -hmm. her husband stood like 6'6". Six, six. And I want to put his, <laughs> no, put his and jacket on. And how tall are you now? <laughs> I was going to say. Well, I, 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 I couldn't break that six. I'm five, eleven, three quarters. <laughs> could never do that. But anyway, I, put his, I looked like a scarecrow when I, when I put his jacket on. And I put newspapers in the, in the toes of his shoes to keep him on my feet. And I went back to school, and I stayed in school. I wanted to be a doctor at first. You know, I was taking the related subjects, biology and all that stuff. And, um, but a talent contest came up. And I went and auditioned, <laughs> nervously, last one in the auditorium <laughs> at the evening audition. I was, okay, I sang. What you want to do? I want to sing. Well, okay, sing. Anyway, they worked it out, and uh, I started singing Nat Cole's Looking Back. And the people milling around the auditorium, they stopped and listening. <laughs> and when I, when I did the climax of the tune, everybody, yeah! <laughs> so Miss Hoffman said, stop, stop. You're going to sing the talent show tomorrow. You're going to sing. <laughs> okay. And she called me the Swoon Crooner. Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first label? Yeah, the, the Swoon, swoon Crooner. Crooner. That's okay. right. And uh, when I sang, I got the climax of the song. I fell on my knees with the microphone, and the place went crazy. Girls were screaming. <laughs> when I realized all this, all these accolades I was getting, I said, career change. I'm going to be an entertainer. That's when I changed my whole thing. So that was the day that you knew music was going to be an important That's part right. of your life. That's it. Anyway, you know, I went on and um, I won seven scholarships in vocal music. And you turned them all down. Why? Because I wanted to be an entertainer. I didn't want to be a, I didn't want to be a high school band teacher, a college professor. I didn't want to do that. So I just did it the hard way. I sang in doo-wop groups, uh, rock and roll groups, blues bands. I sang jazz in a local nightclub. Um, you took any gig you could get at that point. That's it. That's exactly it. Wasn't your grandmother at that point just mortified that you turned down all those college scholarships? Yeah, she was. She was, but I think she somehow she trusted me. I read somewhere that you actually taught yourself how to play the piano, the organ, and the saxophone. I had to because it, I, we couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford a keyboard. I couldn't afford a sax. Ultimately, you, you became part of the Memphis Sound. You were yeah. good enough on keyboards, and you ended up in the Stax Records band, exactly. in house band, playing for people like Otis Redding and many, many other mm -hmm. um, very uh, well-known artists at that time. And you became part of the Memphis Sound that really spread um, across the board yeah. to all types of artists, including yeah. people like Elvis Presley. That's it. So you were making a name for yourself at that point. Yeah, I met David Porter. And he said, hey, man, look, uh, I write lyrics and mainly, and you do music. Let's team up, become a writing team, like Holland Dozier, Holland and like Backrack and David. So I said, okay. So we teamed up and wrote a few flops, but then we found our groove, and we started writing hit songs. I'll say 200 for yeah. big names like Sam and Dave yeah. and Carla Thomas, and you were busy. Yeah. You became a hot commodity for Stax at that point. Yeah, we did. All right, and then in 67, after a late night party, you and a couple other guys put down some tracks and it became your first album called Presenting Isaac Hayes. Yeah. Doug got on the, on, on the bass and um, uh, I got on the piano and Al Jackson on the drums. Y'all follow me, man. <laughs> we <laughs> rehearsed anything. So just... Al let the tape run. And when we had finished, I think, uh, yay tunes later, mm -hmm. he said, I think I got what I want. I didn't take him serious. And a few, a couple of weeks later, he said, Ike, you got to go to the photographer for, for, for a photo session. For what? For your album cover. 
<laughs> oh, you serious? <laughs> but we went, we did it, and and they put it out, and it was it was okay. You know, critics really they didn't kill it. I mean, they they saw what was what it was all about. You were percolating. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And later on, I said, Al said, I got to do an album. Oh, you want me to help you? Okay. I said, Al, can I do one too? Yeah, you can. I want to do another one. I want to do it the way I want to do it. He said, okay, okay. all right. You got carte blanche however you want to do it. So at that time, I recorded. And I did the way I wanted to do it. So Al named the album Hot Butter Soul. And uh, I had those long cuts, only four tunes to the album. Right. And that's when I started talking, you know, rapping on these things. You rapped before rap was cool. Well. <laughs> but it was more of a romantic rap. It was. It was like, it was like delivering a message, telling a story. That, that album was a huge breakthrough, though. It was. Because you had a couple of songs that ended up on a single that were crossover hits. Yeah. People were buying them off the pop charts. That was huge. Yeah. It shocked me. <laughs> <laughs> so Hot Buttered Soul made a huge impact, but I want you to rewind very quickly for me. Because the year before, you had planned to meet Martin Luther King on April 4th, 1968, yeah. the day that he was assassinated. What were you going to talk to him about that day that you were to have met him, the day he was killed? I was going to tell him, sir, I will follow you wherever you go. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a kid, but I'm a young man, but, you know, what if I can do to help you, I'm here. You were roughly 25, going on yeah. 26? Yeah. You put your career on hold for over a year after yeah. his death. I was, I was so bitter. I was so bitter. And a time later I realized, you're not going to get anything. You can't do anything about laying around Hayden. You can't do that. You got to get busy and do what you can do and do what you can do best. So I start back writing. And then comes Shaft. <laughs> <laughs> it is hip, it's cool, it's got a great beat, it's, it's got class, and it literally puts you on the map. The theme for the movie Shaft. Black composer, black director, black cast about the dark side of the black community, the mafia. Mm -hmm. And it had a huge, wide audience. Did you anticipate that? I didn't know it was going to go that way. I, I was just happy to, to have completed something that the producer, Joel Freeman, and the director, Gordon Parks, didn't have my head on a plan. Because I'd never done that. Oh, oh they like it. <laughs> they like it. Phew. What did you think about when you went in creatively? Because it's got it starts out with a really great percussion beat, and it just it moves all the way through. The tambourines are awesome, the horns are awesome, the guitar licks are awesome, and it just all comes together beautifully. Creatively, what what went through your mind? Did you envision what you wanted to hear? You know, Gordon Parks talked to me. He said, "Aji, you have to zero in on the character. This guy Shaft is a roving, a roving guy." moving around all the time, you got to capture that in your music. So he and Joel gave me three scenes on a, on a, on a 16 millimeter film. Uh, when Chef came up out of, out of the uh, subway and when he walked through Harlem, those montages of shots, and when he was with his lady Ellen, he said, now write, some, write something to that. And then meet me in New York at my apartment. <laughs> okay, so the main theme, the rhythm part of the main theme, it took me about two hours. Uh, the shot through Harlem took me about mm, a little better than an hour. Ella's love thing took me about about an hour. And I went to New York and played the tape and, and played against the movieola. Gordon and uh, Joyce, wow, that's good. <laughs> okay, you can go to L.A. now, right? Let's go. <laughs> so in four hours, you essentially create this music that they love. Yeah. It goes on to win you an Oscar, a Golden Globe, and Grammys. You're the first African-American to win an Oscar for Best Original Score. Huge. Yeah, first one to win for music, the third in history to win an Oscar behind Hattie McDaniels and Sidney Poitier. Which is more important to you? Well, I guess, I guess the Oscar for the music, because 
that'll stand forever. It can't be changed. <laughs> I was in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was 1971, and you yeah. continued over the next decade, really, from 69 to 1980. You put out 20 albums, some soundtracks. Mm -hmm. You continued making music. You survived the disco era intact <laughs> and actually had some fun with it. Yeah, I did. What inspires you to write? Well, experiences, personal experiences, and experiences of others, and occurrences in in society in general it's all fodder and is it usually quick for you and once you got the idea is it quick or is it sometimes sometimes you get the idea and then it takes a while to work on it sometimes you get an idea and it lyrics come quick or music comes quick it's you know you never know how the creative faculties work you know. And do you feel at this point in your career that you can still be Isaac Hayes, or do you still feel like you have to kind of conform to what's going to sell commercially? No, I have to try to maintain some artistic integrity. So I do what I do, and I'm not going to I'm not going to change. And and all the time, all this while, you're acting. You were in TV series like Rockford Files. You went on to do things like Miami Vice. You've appeared in roughly three dozen films. In 1977, you ended up signing a new deal here in Atlanta, record deal, and you moved here. What did you I, think about Atlanta when you first moved here? Well, I loved Atlanta because I, what attracted me to Atlanta is so much intelligentsia around here, man. Mm -hmm. And I saw some black women on TV, welfare mothers, that uh, they were arguing with some authorities, you know. And they said, we're not going to take it. Oh, really? <laughs> because where I came from, it was like, yes, sir, Mr. Sons, looking down like that. And they were saying, we're not going to take it. We, we, we deserve this. And oh, I think I moved to Atlanta. <laughs> so you moved to Atlanta and you liked it. Now, mm -hmm. you shared with me that you've been married four times. Mm -hmm. And you actually separated from one of your wives while you were living here. And you're the father of 11 yes. children and 16 grandchildren. Grandkids, exactly. But you like being a father. Yeah, I and a, grandfather. a lot of fun. Girls, uh, they always have little talent shows and stuff. And, and one, each one would be, be, be Apple and Daddy's eye. And I couldn't let them know which one my favorite one was. And I just, <laughs> I just basked in all that, all that, all that uh, warmth and, and, and good love. Your father left when you were a baby, when your mother died, mm -hmm. and you found him again when you were 30 years old. Describe to me what happened. I know he was guilt-ridden, mm -hmm. so I had everybody leave the room. I sat him down. We said, look, I said, I, m I missed you when I was a kid. I needed you. I said, but you know, through the help of God, I grew up. I'm a man now. I'm not going to ask you what happened. Why did you leave? Because... Having been a man for a few years, anything could have caused you to leave. I'm not holding it against you. The most important thing is we found each other. So let's make the best of what's left. Did you? I let him off the hook. And, uh, you know, I, I, f I found his health was bad. I get, put him in the hospital and got him checked up and everything. And I get, bought him a new car and, and a wardrobe of clothes. And one thing he told me, he had a piece of paper in his back pocket. You know those Sunday magazines? The local newspaper? Yeah. He, it, it was worn, folded up in his pocket. He said, I tried to tell them I was your father, but they wouldn't believe me. Yeah. So he had actually tried to approach you before? He was afraid. So we, we, we had 10 good years. I took him on his first plane ride to the first concert. Yeah. Oh, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You're a black icon. Does that come with an awesome responsibility and weight? In your it mind? does. It does. But I try not to let it affect me. I try to take responsibility in, with my integrity and my ethics. But uh, I don't let it steer me in any kind of way that I wouldn't go. You also have an amazing humanitarian spirit. Early in the 90s, you traveled with artist Barry White over to West Africa. Yeah. And it, you were really there for a uh, music. You were, you were, uh, I believe you were shooting a video. We, sh we shot a video in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory but, Coast. But something very profound happened to you on that trip. What happened? Well, what happened? Uh, I saw what was happening in Africa. And uh, 
I wanted to come back. And my friend Dion Ward was invited to Ghana, West Africa. And she said, Isaac, I'm invited to Ghana. You want to go with me? I said, sure, I'll go. <laughs> so that was in 92. We visited the, um, the slave uh, dungeons, the castles. And that's where our, our ancestors were warehoused before they were sent through the Middle Passage. And when I stepped in that room and this guy was t explaining to us what was happening in there, I just had a, a feeling that came over me. It was like I heard the voices of my ancestors. It was like that's all I heard. And then I heard the voice of my ancestors say, we're back home through you. The circle is complete. It's complete. Now you know what you must do. Whoa. And we cried. And you couldn't help but let yeah. tears fall. And uh, when I went back home, I went on a speaking engagement of the Black Expos and encouraging African Americans to go to Africa and interact socially, culturally, and or economically. Just go home and see the place where you're born. And this princess in Queens, New York, heard me speak. And so she called her father back in Ghana. He was a, he was a kingmaker, Nene Kubi III. And she called me weekly and said, Mr. Hayes, uh, would you like to be a king? <laughs> uh, yeah. Tell me your name. As king. My, name my name is Nene mm -hmm. Kateo Kansi I. Now, Nene means king. Kate is a brave warrior type that can fight the wild beast and calm the elements. Okansi was a family name of the family that, that made me king. It means I do as I say. In other, in other words, I'm a person of my word. So you obviously have an enormous attachment to that area now. And you oh. went on to, rather than build a castle, build a school. I built a school. I would go there every year at the festival, and they carry me through the streets like all the other guys, <laughs> chiefs and this stuff. I own a palanquin and from barrels and all that stuff. And uh, I announced at one of the festivals that I was going to build a school. And just like that, they gave me the ground. He had a ground-breaking ceremony. And uh, so I got busy, and I built a school. And it's an 8,000-square-foot architectural design school. And it's high-tech. In it's fact, the students there can actually communicate via the Internet with students yeah. here in the United States in inner-city areas. Yeah, we have some guys from MIT go and teach a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we teach them computer technology. Mm -hmm. We uh, teach them uh, study technology, as well as we teach them um, health education. So um, an amazing thing happened. One night, the chiefs, a delegation of chiefs came over to the hotel and said, Nene, you've done something no one else has done. You brought some education for our families. He said, we really thank you. Now we're going to do something for you. Here in, in Ada, there are 10 clans. We've been fighting and feuding for over 100 years. We're going to stop. We're going to stop this. And we're going to unite behind you. Wow. <laughs> they said, that's not all. We, uh, see, where our die is, is where the Volta River empties into the Atlantic Ocean. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of estuary out there, a lot of islands. They said, uh, we're going to give you an island. One thing, though, we're not going to pick it out for you. You've got to pick out your own island. So the next day, we got a big boat, <laughs> <laughs> and we were around island shopping. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wasn't it mind-blowing? Oh, it was awesome. It's beautiful. We, we found one. It took us about 45 minutes to circumvent it. And uh, you had to check it out. Ninety-six point four acres. You know, it had one little mud head on it. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, I got to figure. Well, I think I'm gonna make it a health retreat, retreat over there. Tell me about your health regime, because you know, I in doing my research for this interview, I saw where you told Tavis Smiley back in the fall of two thousand and four that you were on day fifteen of a thirty-day fast. Yes, oh yeah, oh, I fast. Do you do this lot. often? Yeah, I do it about four or five times a year. Um, is it to drop weight or is it a cleansing process? Both of them, okay. to drop weight and detox. Do you work out? Yeah, I work out. I do some cardio, you know, and, and then I'm, I'm getting back in the weight train. You said you were doing that so you could wear your chains again. Put the chains back <laughs> on. There you go. <laughs> in addition to your workout routines, um, you have made a commitment to really eat better. And you have turned out two cookbooks, one which is a bestseller, and one very recent in the unfortunate situation of the passing of Barry White roughly a year ago because of ke uh, kidney failure. 
And your new book is Kidney Friendly Comfort, Comfort Foods, Foods. A, a collection of recipes that are kidney friendly. We all lost Baron. I lost a father and a grandfather to, to kidney disease. And the cookbook is it's some great recipes, and it's low in phosphorus, and it's low in sodium, and it's free. Well, you started a lot of things. You, you, a wave of music, um, rap before rap was cool, with what you call a romantic rap. Uh, but you have taken um, recently a stand and said to Capitol Hill, people on Capitol Hill and in the schools and school systems, we have really done our kids a disservice by taking music out of the schools. It's imperative to their education. And look, I can see by your face. Yeah, you're right, because, you know, the first thing that goes when they start cutting budgets is uh, are the arts, and that should be the last thing to go. If we don't have arts, what do we have? A society without an art is like, it's like Taliban. So Empty, vacant. Exactly. It has no love, no life, no exactly. passion. So I, that's why I fight for a lot. And through my foundation, uh, I support literacy as well as music education in schools, especially in the cities. What would you say to members of the black community about what they need to be doing? Young guys today, 15, 16 year old men, what do they need to be doing? You guys need to be more ethical, put something in your hood, contribute, put something back, and try to save a kid, try to inspire a kid the right way. I know one of your philosophies is looking back, because until you look back, whether it's at very distant ancestors, your own grandparents, your own parents, and your own life. You have to look back before you can plan where you're going to go. Go forward. Because you have to know where you've been to see where you're going. What advice do you give to your children and your grandchildren? Take some responsibility. Take responsibility. And think about your ethics. When you were a little boy and you were five and you were looking up in the sky and you thought, I want to be somebody, are you proud of who you've become? I am. Um, my grandmother's teaching stuck to me, stuck with me. And uh, I didn't steal, I didn't rob. I respected old people. I stuck to the right road, and I'm glad I did. Above all else, is your grandmother's validation the most important? Oh, yes. Because that old lady, she saw through some rough times. When I went to the Oscars, she was my date. And uh, I had a house in L.A., in Beverly Hills, and I took her to see the house, and we walked around the grounds. I had four acres out there, and the flowers were blossoming and everything. She said, she said look around and said, Lord, have mercy. I never did think I'd live to see this. I choked because I knew what she was saying. I knew what she was saying, all the rough times we went through, and she never thought that, but there she was right in the midst of all of it. <laughs> and I, I prayed to God that he kept her alive so that she could share in my success, and it happened. With that, I want to say thank you, Isaac Hayes, for this conversation. It has been wonderful. Thank you. This has been a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting.